We ask that you keep us mindful of that gift and the ever-present promise that our Lord protects us from sin, death, and the devil, not just when he died on the cross 2,000 years ago, but every day as he protects us as our good shepherd. But we ask your blessing upon our Bible study today as we dig into the creed and learn a little bit more about you and what you've done for us. Help bless our conversation that it, be, that it may build us up and glorify you. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So, oh, wait, I apologize. I said the wrong page. Let me give you the right page. I started looking at it and I was like, wait a minute, that's really long for the first article. Because the first article is like one second. Uh, all right, it is page 133. 133. Sorry about that. All right, so if you remember from last week, who is the first article about? Who? Huh? The Father, right? God the Father. And if you would sum it up with one word, what is it about? That's the creed in general. We're just looking at the first article. Okay. Creation. Right? It is about God the Father and creation. So let's on page 133 there, let's say that together. I also have it in your handout. Uh, we're going to say, we're going to recite it together like we just did in church. Okay? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that He has given me my body and soul eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness to me. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. All right, now why do you think Luther wrote that long explanation for the one sentence there at the beginning of the Greek? Any ideas? everything in detail. Yeah, he covers everything in detail, right? And why does he want to do that? Why does he want to go even to these minute details, do you think? Well, in the creed, it says it makes heaven and earth, but in his explanation, it shows how we are part of heaven. Okay, so it goes into more detail about how we're a part of the making of heaven and earth, right? And I think he also does this because he specifically wants to point out that we're not just praising God's initial act of creation all that time ago. But we're, we're, we're actually thanking God the Father for his continual act of creation and the sustaining of our first article gifts, which is what we're going to get into a little bit today. Right? Uh, first article gift is anything in that big long list he gave, right? And all the stuff that falls into those categories, right? So your eyeballs, your ears, your sense of touch your body, the abilities that you have, maybe, uh, how many people in here can sing pretty well? You a decent singer? Oh, we don't have very much confidence in our singing. <laughs> or what about, maybe you're pretty athletic. You just sort of pick up on, you pick up on movements and jumping and things like that pretty quickly. Or maybe uh, you love to read and you're able to process information quickly when you read. Or maybe uh, you're very creative, right? Um, some of us have some of those gifts and some of us have others, right? And the list goes on and on. Those are all first article gifts, things we would call first article gifts. And we call them first article gifts because we're praising them and we're saying that we believe they came from God in the first article of the creed. Right? That's part of being the maker of heaven and earth. Right? Our created gifts are part of that creation that God made. Right? Uh, and, and, and we glorify God through the use of those gifts, 
as well as give him thanks for giving them to us. Right? Now, why might that be an essential thing for a Christian to understand? That all of those varied gifts that we just listed and even more actually come from God. It's particularly relevant in our culture right now. Okay, so we have a tendency to take those for granted and think that they're they belong to us, right? And we give ourselves the credit for those things. What else? All right, we're not a random happenstance. We'll get into some of that today because we can't talk about creation without also talking about all the competing theories about how it happened. There's one other really important one that I think is probably going to be relevant more than the others in the years, the immediate years to come. It has to do with, yeah. Dependency. Dependent, what do you mean? What, what do you mean by dependency? We depend on God for everything. Okay. So we, that we depend on God for everything, right? And, and, and as Dave pointed out, we forget that pretty easily at times. Right? But the point that I'm getting at is a lack, like not liking the gifts that you've been given or thinking that there's some sort of mistake, right? That's a very popular view in our culture right now that, well, if, if you're not exactly like the mold says, somebody's made a mistake, there's something wrong with you and you shouldn't like yourself. You should try to be something else, right? Now, the extreme versions of that are obviously to show up with gender issues right now, right? But even minor versions of that sort of sense of loss of self or not liking yourself manifest in feeling like your gifts are less than other people's gifts or that if i was really loved by god i would be able to sing and be athletic and blah 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 blah, blah whatever whatever our world values right and so what the first article is saying is whether or not our culture values your gifts they come from god which means they're not a mistake. He intended to give them to you. And you can glorify him by using those gifts. Right? And we love watching movies and reading stories about people that recognize that, right? Maybe they're not the most athletic in the room or the best looking or the most intelligent. And yet they end up over the course of the story you read about them, really showing those other people what the human experience is all about by glorifying God using the gifts that they're given, right? Uh, and that's really what we're talking about with first article gifts. And I think that's one of the reasons why Luther includes the whole gamut of stuff, right? Okay. So look at the bottom of 133 here. No one but God can create heaven and earth. This truth determines how I understand myself and how I relate to God in this world. All right, let's... Uh, open up our Bibles. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 2, starting verse 7. So open up your Bible to Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 7. So this is the part of Genesis where we're reading particularly about God creating what? Man, right? Mankind, us. So starting verse 7, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. So I, I share a name with the person in this story. Right? I had a Hebrew teacher at the seminary that always walked up and go, Oh, Adam! Right? Because that's how you would say my name in Hebrew. Do you know what it means? Yeah, it can mean it can be mankind if you wanted to be lofty about it, but it also can mean dirt, dust, earth, right? Because what did man get made out of? Right? The man, the dust from the ground, right? Lest I lest any of us start to get super proud about ourselves. You're made from mud. All right. <laughs> And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. 
The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first was the Pishon, blah, 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 blah. We'll skip the river part. That's not super important what we're talking about today. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat it, you eat of it, you shall surely die. So what was the original job given from God to man? Huh? Yeah, right? To tend his garden. Right? In other words, if we expand that out, he's telling him to take care of his creation, right? Being, uh, we, we read in Genesis chapter one that when we were created, he gave us dominion over his creation, right? That's part of the reflection of being made in the image of God. And we learn from Jesus that when you have dominion over something, according to God, what does that mean? You spend of yourself for its benefit, whatever you rule over, right? It's not lorded over, but done in a servant manner. So we're meant to take care of creation. Well, you know the story, right? It's not good that man is alone. So he makes Eve and brings her to the man. And then he names all, well, first he names all of the other animals and not a suitable helper is found. Then God makes him a suitable helper. Uh, and then we get to verse 23. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So, how are we created to be in a relationship with God? Before chapter 3 happens here. Take care of his creation. And in doing that, what are we doing in our relationship with God? Serving, serving him, right? Obeying, very good, right? Uh, serving and obeying are those values that our culture espouses. Not really, right? Maybe in pockets, but obedience is seen as sort of like um, you're you're not thinking for yourself that you need to you need to be your own person. You're letting this other person control you, and right? they usually don't make a distinction between manipulation and obedience. Uh, and then service is valued in a certain sense, but not in a biblical sense. Right? Service is valued in an external fashion, but not as a way of glorifying God by taking care of creation. Right? Okay. So we're now we're going to look at, uh, open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 4. This is the first in our handout. We're going to look at um, the other main part of this first part of the creed, the first article, is that God is our Father. How do we know that? You can't look at a grand tree or a pretty sunset and be like, oh, God is my Father. So how do we know? So verses 22 and 23 of Exodus 4. So we want to read that for us. Go ahead, Trish. 22 and 23, right? Uh, yes. Then tell Pharaoh that this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you to let my son go so that he may worship me. But since you have refused to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. All right, so how does God consider the people he's made a covenant with? What does he call them? He calls them his firstborn son, right? So God, you know, you don't, we don't get to say, oh, God is my father, right? He has to be the one that says that that's the way our relationship works, right? So in Ephesians 4, he's doing that. All right, uh, now Psalm 103, verse 13. Let's see, Rob, can you look up that one? As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. All right, he's working ahead. Sorry. No, you're good. Uh, and then Galatians 3 26. Somebody have that one? And then Matthew chapter 6 is the last one. I'll read that one myself. I have Galatians 
right, go ahead, Laura. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Very good. Right, so when Christ comes into the picture, our primary identity becomes children of God. Right? We're about to start the Lord's Prayer and Confirmation class, and that's one of the first things we talk about, because what are the first two words of the Lord's Prayer? Our, our Father, right? So we talk about how God creates that relationship with us, and then it has to be restored in Jesus. All right, and then Matthew chapter 6, verses 26 to 27. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Right, so your heavenly Father knows your needs. Right, so God is our Father. And what else are we saying here about God the Father in the first article to the creed? Right there in the words. Takes care of us. God the Father, what? Takes care of us all your life. He does. But we're looking for a particular word. I think I heard someone say it. Almighty. Almighty, right? He is not just God the Father, but he's God the Father Almighty. Right? What does Almighty mean? Uh Pete, can you look up Isaiah 44, verse 6? Uh Dave, can you look up the Job 37, verse 23? Uh, Bob, can you look up Luke 1, 37 to 38? And Maggie, can you look up the Psalm 139? Actually, we'll do Psalm 139 together at the end. That one's a few verses. Whenever you're ready, Pete. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. All right. So pretty uh, strong, direct words from God that he is, in fact, the only God, and there are no others. All right, uh, Dave? The Almighty, we cannot find him. He is great in power, justice, and abundant righteousness. He will not violate. Very good. Great in power. All right, and then uh, Luke 1. 37 and 38. For no word, I think I got the right one. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant. Your answer may now may your word may be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. All right. I think that first part there, right? That my word will not uh, be violated. All right. Then if everyone wants to turn to Psalm 139, everybody turn to Psalm 139. We're going to read a few verses from there. Maggie, you want to read the first five verses for us? O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from before. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in before, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll take a word. Uh, where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. 
So, God is almighty. Right? There's no place you can go where he's not there. He knows everything about you. He is in front of you and behind you. Right? Other places in scripture it says that he knows the number of the hairs on your head. Right? And to, to demonstrate that nothing escapes him. Right? And even here they talk about how he knew of you and saw your days before you were even born. Right? So that's, that is the kind of being that our Father in Heaven is. Pastor? Yeah. I, I like how in the psalm it says how we were woven, yet um, in the New Testament, when he calls us a workmanship, and it's referred to that we're, we're, we're a poem that he has created. And I just love the, 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 the imagery of we're not just created, but when you weave something, you're making something artful. And when you're a poem, you're making something artful. He not only created us, but he made us to be enjoyed. Right. Yes. Right. And then that's that's all wrapped up in that phrase that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Right. Um, he didn't make just the bare minimum, but a creative masterpiece. And if you've ever tried to create something, you know, like if you really think about the way the human body is. It's an incredible work of creation, one that we can't even come close to duplicating, right? Um, and like the abuse that it can take, being mistreated for years and years and years, and it still works, right? The um, you know it, when it's working well and you're treating it well, you know I mean it, it just is incredible. And when you start learning, I still remember when I first started learning in science class, you get into like the minute details of cells and the functions within cells and how intricate even those are. It is just amazing the stuff that God has done in creation. Right? Good point, Pete. All right. So now we've got God the Father, He's Almighty. And then we get to the creation portion. He's the maker of heaven and earth. So the sacred scriptures rejects three ways of viewing creation. One A is materialism. So can somebody sort of summarize the view of materialism for me? Everybody's familiar with it? The value of things. Value of things, okay. That is a like a belief associated with materialism, but materialism is a, a whole world view. So it's that and more. What else is a part of materialism? Money, Money okay. It's what you want. Huh? It's what you want. You know, okay, we're, we're focusing on the like effects of materialism, but what is materialism itself? So materialism is actually like a total worldview about the universe, right? Um, so when it comes to creation, if you're a materialist, you have to assume that matter is in some form or fashion eternal. It's always been there. Otherwise, how do you answer the question of where did it come from? Right, so that most people who espouse theories like evolution, they don't fully hold to the tenets of materialism because then they would have to say matter is eternal, right? Which implies a sort of metaphysics about the universe that they don't really want to admit. But if they don't do that, you can always ask the question, well, where'd that come from? Like, well, there were some gases that came with, okay, where'd those come from? Well, and then before they became gases, there was, okay, well, where'd those come from, right? And at some point, for any sort of coherent view of creation, there has to be some eternal thing, right? And so a materialist says, matter is eternal. It's always been here in some form or another, right? And so evolution then makes sense if you believe that, because evolution came from that original matter, whatever it was. Right? So the scriptures rejects that theory. Uh, and how is that propelled? How would materialism, and then particularly through the theory of evolution, be propelled to what we see today? Earth day. Huh? It's like having Earth Day. <laughs> what do you mean? Like last week was Earth Day. Supposed to, either mother Gaia or oh, well, that would actually not be. No, we're, we're, 
That would actually not be evolution. That would be paganism. That would be like animism, where you're believing in like deities associated with nature. Evolution uses the mechanism of death, actually. Right. So evolution assumes death is a part of creation, because it's only by death and the survival of the fittest that you get the the better mutated creatures. Right. And so right away, before you even get into the intricate details of whether or not evolution makes any sense from a probability perspective, when you look at what we can observe in creation, you can ask somebody the question, okay, so if you're a Christian who's trying to like hold those, both those views, you can say, okay, but the problem with evolution is it assumes death is a natural part of creation. And in fact, not only a natural part of creation, but an integral part. Because without death, human beings would have never come into existence. We would have stayed as this primordial soup, or whatever the theory is. Right? Um, and so that is grounds for me, and I've never heard a very good answer from somebody who believes in evolution without that, especially if they're trying to hold it in, in tandem with their Christian faith to account for the place of death in that theory. Because what does the scripture say about death? Where did death come from according to the scriptures? Sin. sin, right? The wages of sin is death, which means it was not an intended part of God's original creation. It was brought in from the outside. It is the end result of the corruption of creation by sin. Right? Death holds a totally different place in the theory of evolution. Okay. Um, and I don't know how much you want to get into that or how much you're curious about that. Um, there's a bunch of other things that you can talk about with evolution as well. Um, you, may have, you may or may not have heard of the argument about biologically complex, like irreducibly complex machines in biology. Um, so that argument is, well, let's say that like a giraffe is a good example. So a giraffe has a system within its body, within its neck, that essentially prevents it from passing out when it lifts its head up from loss of blood due to gravity, or from its brain exploding when it leans its head down from all the blood rushing to its brain. And let's say that I don't know exactly the number of parts that this mechanism has, this biological mechanism, but let's say it's like 17. Right? And the argument is that over a long, long period of time, that system evolved to a functional system that we have today. The problem is, Biologically speaking, if you remove even just one of those components, the whole thing doesn't work at all. Like it's not that it just sort of works and eventually becomes better. It has to have all the pieces it currently has or it just doesn't work, period. And so there's an argument that's like, how do you mutate to get to a system like that? Because it has to all be present at the same time or it doesn't work at all, right? There's a lot of things like that. Um, so I would encourage you, especially if you're a parent with young kids, because this is a theory your, your kids are going to be like drowned with in school. Um, and they're not going to hear composing or competing ideas or objections to it um, to do some work on that on your own. And I have some resources I can point you to. Um, so, and I know we've got quite a few Christian teachers or former teachers in here. I'm sure they've got some insight on that topic as well. A great book on that if you guys are interested. It's called Darwin Black. Um, it's written by a Christian biochemist and he okay. basically just destroys by examples like that, that if things evolve, they must have come from something reducible from where it's at. And there are so many examples in that book where he goes, it falls apart completely. Um, Darwin's Black Box? Yes, it's yeah. by uh, uh, Dr. Behe. B-E-H-E. Oh, that's easy to heard. By Dr. Behe. Darwin's Black Box by Dr. B um, is a resource she recommends. Um, and then there's the other one that I've heard. Uh, we had a, the church that I did field work at when I was at the seminary. The associate pastor's wife was a biochemist. And uh, she talked about how even just forming an amino acid in a cell is such a complex and particular procedure because the mRNA goes into the nucleus and gets the information from the DNA and brings it out. And according to the information in a particular order in the DNA is how a, a protein is made from amino acid strains. And amino acid strain, if one of those things is out of order, the whole thing is non-functional, right? So another thing again, where 
everything has to be in the right order to even function period, not even to a degree, right? And the, the chances of like those sorts of sequences coming about through just random happenstance are like, I think it was something like if you cut down every tree and made it all into paper, there wouldn't be enough paper to write the number of zeros you would need in order to account for the chance that would be required for something like that to occur. I mean, just super crazy low number. Yeah, Ron. Another thing, a uh, good thing to bring up is the difference between macroevolution and microevolution. Because all the evolution examples that are given are, are microevolution. Real minor changes, but it still stays the same. Yes. There's no macroevolution. Rob, it's like you, you're like, you're, you got some notes for my lectures. You always bring up stuff right before I get there. Uh, <laughs> which is great. It's great. It's a, it's a very nice segue for me. Um, so the point that Rob made is uh, that there's uh, macroevolution and microevolution. And I teach this in confirmation class as well. Microevolution is changed within a species. So like the famous example of evolution was the, the finches on, uh, on the Galapagos Islands, right? That their beaks adapted so that they could eat the certain kinds of food that they needed to, right? That's an example of microevolution. And we've observed many instances of that in creation. And it is not contrary to biblical belief to hold microevolution as a, as a thing. In fact, we would probably say that that was built into the DNA of creatures when God made them in order so that they can adapt to different circumstances. Right? That would be consistent with biblical understanding of creation. Right? Macroevolution is different. Macroevolution has changed from one species to another. So the big example for that one is that we originally came from apes. And became humans, right? So we were actually changing species, okay? Um, and that is contrary to scripture, and we don't agree with it. Because um, the, if you look at the Genesis account, it specifically says that God makes all of the different kinds of animals, right? Um, and so it's not like coming from one common ancestor, uh, which is another point that they'll make, uh, which is like, well, if God made, I mean, we're all sort of carbon-based life forms. So if God made the world, he probably used the same elements to make up things as well. So like the cell and the nucleus and the DNA and all that stuff are all basic general formats for all of life. And the argument that an evolutionist would make is that points to a common ancestry and a singular species because of all those similarities. We would say, well, no. I mean, why do all cars have four wheels? Do they all descend from a common car? Or are they just all designed in the same way because it's a good way to design a car? Right? So in one instance, you're implying a designer and the other instance you're saying just sort of randomly happened because they all came from like the car. Right? The funny thing about what Rob brought up, uh, in the scientific community, the evolutionists don't even believe in that Um you know, the, the way they combat and, and hold on to where evolutionists is, they go, do, do you agree that adaptation happens? Like, yeah, of course it happens. Do you agree mutation happens? Yeah, of course it happens. Do you agree survival of the fittest happens? Yeah, that happens. There, evolution. Huh? What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so, like, Things evolve, but not from one substance to a completely different substance. Right. Um, well, in my experience when I was in school, it, it definitely could be different now because, you know, it's been over a decade. Um, but uh, when I was at a state university, it was mostly just like the general idea of evolution was what people knew. They didn't know any particularities about the theory. It wasn't taught in great depth. Uh, I think intentionally so, because even by scientific standards, it starts to break down pretty quickly. Um, so I had a, there, you know, you always have the, the crazy religious folks who come on college campuses. And, and this guy wasn't too terrible. I've seen some people that are just like, okay, I don't know how you're serving the gospel here. But uh, this guy came to talk about evolution um, in particular because he felt like, and he's probably mostly right, that the school was not giving kids a full picture of evolution itself as well as all the competing theories um, that object to it. 
and I was at, they was having a conversation. And I had, I was this is my vicarage, so I was doing my office hours in the student union building. I did campus ministry for my vicarage at Virginia Tech, and I was sitting there and I was just watching because it was very entertaining. Yeah, I was very like rah, 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 and the students were all crowded around listening and, and some of them making fun of him and trying to come up with things that would stump him. And I was just standing there and I, I was I was only you know 20 what 24 at the time 25 so I, I looked pretty much like a college student and not a vicar on a pastoral internship. So I was sitting there outside eating my lunch and some guy walks up and says well, yeah, well, why do you believe in the Bible? Because they say that you're not supposed to wear two different kinds of fabric, and yet you do. And it's sort of like, boom, he drops a mic and walks away, right? Because that's what mostly college students do when they talk about this stuff. They have like seven zingers that they'll say, and they won't even stick around for a response. Well, he sort of like meandered away and then ended up standing next to me, and he was just assuming that I was another college student, one of the enlightened, I suppose. He said, can you believe this guy? He doesn't believe in the theory of evolution, and that's crazy. Like only dumb people do. I was like, well, there's a reason it's called a theory. It's not proven. And then he just sort of looked at me and walked away. Um, <laughs> but like, so to Pete's point, like a lot of the people that you'll engage with on topics related to particularly evolution, there's not a whole lot of depth typically. I mean, it, there are exceptions, of course, but it's, it's just because it's thought that way. You know, it's a, it's a generally held belief. And I use that word intentionally. It's not really a scientific experimental statement. It's a belief in a, in a system of explanation about creation. Right. Okay, enough on that. Uh, letter B, top of the back, the back of the uh, handout there. Pantheism, who knows what pantheism is? Everything is identified with God. Everything, right? That's what pan means, is all God. Right, so like you're God, you're part of God, I'm part of God, that tree is part of God, the grass is part of God, like God is everything. Right? Um, that's not a very common view in the United States or in the Western world, really. That's more of an Eastern one. It's becoming more, it's becoming more of a thing here. Um, like uh, a lot of people who practice Buddhism or uh, Hinduism, I mean, Hinduism is definitely falls into the camp of pantheism. Uh, Buddhism does sometimes, depending on which part of it you practice. Um, but yeah, so that was pretty self-explanatory. Uh, all right, and then letter C, deism. What is the belief of deism? There's an almighty God who made everything and then just kind of hit the road. Yes. So you may have heard, if you want to write this on your handout, this is also like the watchmaker God theory is that there's an almighty God who initially created everything, but he doesn't stick around. He does not, he doesn't sustain it. He doesn't perpetuate it. He just made it and wound it up like a watch and then let it go. Thomas Jefferson even took, what was it? The, yes, he even took his Bible and moved parts and literally ripped them off. Yes. Yeah, so Thomas Jefferson was definitely the yes. Um, But what's wrong with this view? From a scriptural perspective, the Jews would have ceased to exist hundreds of times over. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, the, uh, given the Old Testament, the Jews would have been done a long time ago, right? Um, because they were not a powerful country or people in the ancient world. And the ancient world was a brutal place where, when you were taken over by another country, you know, depending on what they wanted to do with you, they put all your men to the sword. And then they kidnapped all of your women and children and forced them to assimilate into their, their culture or enslaved you, right? So a weak nation with not very many people, like Israel, would not have survived if God had just sort of made things and then left. But there wouldn't have even been a nation of Israel to begin with, because how does God begin the nation of Israel? What does he do? What happens with Abraham? He just tells Abraham, you know, hey, you know, go where I'm telling you. Just keep listening to each thing I tell you. Right. God, God is the one who comes and finds Abraham and tells him and makes the covenant with him, right? So that's certainly not a watchmaker God, right? Because he shows up again, right? That's one of the particularities of the Christian confession of faith in God is that he is an agent, an actor with actual historical significance. 
right, in a linear sense, right, not a, a rebirth, reincarnation cycle, but like that time that he came to Abraham, that actually happened at a particular time and place. That time he sent Jesus, that happened at a particular time and place, right? And so, uh, and then like probably the best example in the Christian faith that this is not a compatible view of the scriptures is Jesus himself, right? If he was a watchmaker God, he never would have sent Jesus, right? He probably would have just let the watch destroy itself once sin became a part of creation. Yeah, Pete. Also, if you look at People whose job it is to to verify ancient writings. If you look at like Homer's Iliad, and you look at the amount of evidence to show that yes, Homer wrote this, and we know this is true, and then you look at the amount of evidence uh, for, especially the Old Testament scripture, it's it's mountains of evidence more than that. We hold that we don't. Nobody questions Homer wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, but there's all these questions about like the historical texts in, in the Old Testament. And if you have that mouth of evidence and you read about like the Shekinah glory where God was in their presence, it wouldn't have been written down if it wasn't true. Um, because writing something back in those times took a lot of effort, took a lot of money, and, and, and it was passed down from generation to generation, you know, meticulously. Um, yeah, that, that alone is, is enough evidence. Well, the, the other thing, too, that's important to note um, is, and I'm, and I'm highlighting some of these things because, in particular, these are issues that people are going to press you on uh, when it comes to issues of faith, uh, especially in the world of academics. So, you know, parents listen up, you got kids going into in the school or going up, off to college or whatever. This is, this is a big part of the discourse, and that is, um, like, the standards by which they evaluate the efficacy of a regular historical book are not anywhere near the same standard they hold the scriptures to. Right? Um, if you're reading a, a work of Plato and there's a strange word that shows up that seems to contradict the sentence before, they in no way, form, or fashion say that means the whole work gets tossed out. Right? And one of the reasons they don't do that is because some of the earliest manuscripts we have of like Greek philosophy from the, the three big ones, Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato, are not even from the, the I, I think they're like seven, seven or eight hundred uh, years after those guys were alive. Now notice they never talk about that in your philosophy class. Nobody's arguing about the, the uh, legitimate authorship of those books in a real sense, right? Um, so just be aware of that when it comes to the scriptures, that there's a really bizarre standard that, they're, that are applied to the efficacy of the scriptures and their authorship and stuff that are applied to no other book. And like objectively speaking, there's more historical evidence for the scriptures than any other ancient book, period. There just is. Uh, and if you want to talk about that in more detail, I'm happy to do that. But that's not today. Okay. Number two, read Genesis 1 1 through Genesis 2 25. Um, so we'll open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. You can tell me where Genesis chapter 1 is in the Bible. <laughs> the end, in the middle, the beginning. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I think it comes right after Revelation. <laughs> All right. Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, there's a couple of things here that we don't really understand the presence of the waters and, and the actual the Hebrew word for deep, or sorry, for void. And deep are, are not really clearly understood the only time they're used in the scriptures. Uh, but we were meant to understand here what is the eternal being in our view of the universe? What's always been there? God, right? So the first point there A, God creates out of blank. What does he create out of? Nothing, nothing right? God creates out of nothing. Pastor? Yeah. 
So if I read that sentence and say, you know, in, in the beginning, God, we, we always acknowledge that, that God was um, always there. Yep. And then the empty darkness was over the surface of the deep. So am I also saying that darkness was here from the beginning? And what does that, what does that mean to you? So the darkness would be, is not really a thing from a scriptural perspective, is not really a thing in and of itself. It's the absence of a thing, right? So notice what's the first thing that God creates? Well, I'm bothered by that also because uh, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> in and with the uh, darkness. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's where like the the deep, I believe it's the word for the, the Hebrew word for deep uh, is not really translated. Okay. Um, it's I think the only occurrence of that word, like pretty much ever. So we're not sure what it means. Um, so this is a good example of where we apply like one of our principles for reading scripture. Uh, and that is to let the clear parts of scripture inform the unclear parts. Yep. And so this would this would definitely constitute as an unclear part, which is good that you asked that question because. It is a natural question that, that especially if somebody is new to the faith, they might ask, like, okay, well, you said that God created everything, but it seems like there's waters and deep and, and stuff already going on. Um, I mean, one simple answer to that could be, although you don't want to get too off into speculative speculation, is that he also created those, but they're not part of the creation of the heavens and the earth. Right? So the, the Genesis 1 is chronicling the creation of the heavens and the earth. And we know that God creates outside of both, or is existing outside of both of those things. So do these also exist outside of that? Maybe. Sorry, I don't have a more satisfying answer to the question. It's the first time I've been unsatisfied reading the verse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm with you there. Because um, it does introduce elements that we don't really, we can't really explain. But I would I would say um, there are times in scripture where that happens quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And our typical understanding of those times is if the text isn't clear and doesn't really clearly inform us, then they're not important for us to know, <laughs> or they're not intended for us to know. Right. And that isn't like a cop out as far as like, well, that's kind of hard to understand. So I guess you know, we're not meant to know, but it's like scholars have been asking those questions for a long time. There's still no answer, or at least no clear one. Yeah, Dave. So is infinity? There's a concept we can understand. We can understand infinity. Well, sure. Right. I mean, even though we're going to be eternal beings, like I have no idea what that's supposed to be like. Right. Or the concept of God always having been there is understandably outside of my ability to understand because I'm a creature within creation. I'm a part of the heavens and the earth. Right. And so. God exists outside of that, right? He's the creator of that. He's the creator of time. He's the creator of space, right? So, like, it makes sense that I do not understand how he can be an eternal being that's just always been there. I mean, because then you start asking questions like, well, how long did he wait <laughs> to create the heavens and the earth? Like, how long was he just sitting there floating around, hovering over the waters? And where do the waters come from, right? Um, were those... Just like the first thing he made, and he was just swimming around in the waters until he got bored and then made the heavens and the earth. I have no idea. Um, maybe you can ask him when you get to heaven. He might answer. Yeah. The way I read it, it says in verse one, why he created the heavens and the earth. Then in verse two, this earth that he just created was without form and void. I don't think there's a contradiction. I think. Well, I don't think there's there's definitely not a contradiction, but there is an element. Um, it was without form and void, and then he did the light. 
Oh, I see what you're saying. Verse one says that he created it first. To me, that comes before, because I was wondering why I never noticed that before. Oh, you might be right there. Maggie might have saved us from confusion here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the heavens and the earth are created. The earth was without form and void. So it hadn't been put to shape yet. And darkness was over the face of the deep. So I guess presumably the darkness and the face of the deep and the, the face of the waters were like the unformed elements of the heavens and the earth, I guess. I think probably a better question there is the term darkness there. <clears throat> the same term that we use as darkness to be an antithesis of the light of God. Or is it a different word for darkness? Uh, it's probably a different one because it's not really being described here as like a, a like an evil. I, I looked up the Hebrew word of wahosek. Um, maybe you know the other term for darkness. I don't. Well, so mo most of the most of the, the references to darkness as being like the antithesis of the light of God are in the New Testament. Okay. But I'd have to look that up. I don't know. Okay. I'm making a note to investigate this more in depth <laughs> um, so that we can clear this up. But I think Maggie's on the right track here um, with regards to like the presence of those things are after the creation of the heaven and the earth. Because the, the big theme in Genesis chapter one when God creates is is moving from a place of chaos and and like disorder to a place of order, right? And so um, this could be like the representation of like the heavens and the earth. He made them, and so maybe this is all the stuff that's in them that He made. And then the next section of Genesis one is His ordering of all of those things. Right? Um, but I will. I will look into that, and we can talk about that next next week. I'll give you some more information. There. Okay, uh, Genesis chapter one verse three, and God said, "Let there be light," and there was light. So let it be there. God creates by the power of His blank, His word. Right? He says, and there is. Got a few minutes left here so but you can look at those references if you would like those are just like supporting scriptural references for the points we're making here um, we don't have time to go into all of them but uh god creates blank note genesis 1 5 8 13 19 23 and 31 so if you're looking for something that's repeated in genesis chapter 1 about six times what might that be there is evening and morning, the first day, the second day, right? And notice what's what's created first? Mm -hmm. The light, right? So that you can begin to go away from the chaos and disorder of darkness to having a day and a night, right? So he's ordering the creation. So God creates God creates time. Is that that blank there? Time, day, night. Right, because think about that. How would you be able to order time if you had no day and night? Because pretty much every unit of time that we would use is based off of the days and nights, right? Hours, years, weeks, etc. Is it worth getting into the difference between the younger Christians and the older Christians? Um we could do that. I mean, I don't have any material prepared for that today, but if you want, if we want to go into that, we can. Um, do, would you guys be interested in having a discussion between about the differences between young earth creations and the older earth Christians? Or no? I, I, don't, I don't know what that means. Yeah, I don't know what that means. It's a, it's a, it's between like Christians who have disagreement on how old the earth is. I mean, I would, I would say the the age of the earth, especially based on like carbon dating and and scientific methods of, of deciding age, are all pretty moot in my book. 
Uh, and they're moot, not for the reason that they're necessarily unreliable. I think some of them are because uh, they can't account for variables like a flood, for example. Um, but the other reason is like, who's to say that God wouldn't create the earth? He could, if he wanted to, make it look old right from the very beginning, if he wanted to. So it's just sort of like a, it gets into a, a land of speculation that I don't think is, can be fascinating at times, but not super fruitful. I had the fun job of trying to teach biology to a bunch of Orthodox Jewish boys. And the head rabbi basically said that to me. He goes, listen, teach them what they need to pass the SAT. <laughs> but how do we know God did not create this, what you call 13 billion old earth, to make it look like it was 13 billion years old? And I looked at him, I'm like, why would he do that? He goes, who are you to question God? I'm like, who are you to say that's what God did? <laughs> Which all ends up actually in the same places. It's just like, right. It's he gone. should have done whatever he wanted. Yeah. Um, and, and for those who don't understand, um, the Jews and some Christians believe that there's a 10,000 year earth. And I think we're, what, we, what are we in right now? About 5,800? Something like that. I don't keep up with that, so I'm not sure. Maybe. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> like you said, it, it, it doesn't. Um, Change my salvation. So it looks like Rob, I can get you some information about that. I've read a lot about it. Okay. All right. Uh, and then the last letter there, D, uh, from Psalm 19, 1 through 5. I'll read that for us. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And then he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. God creates with a voice. Yeah, voice, very good voice. Okay, I think... We started earlier today, so I think we're probably we'll be go you gonna go to 1145. Okay. Instead of we've been going to new recently, but we started earlier. So we've got four more minutes. Everybody with that? Okay. All right. We agree. All right. <laughs> uh letter or letter. Number three, blank are also part of God's creation. So let's turn to Psalm 91. All right, we're starting at verse 11. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. So blank are also part of God's creation. Angels. Very good. And then uh, A there. Angels pray, praise blank and serve blank. I'll give you a hint. There's one answer. Yeah. Huh? Is it praise God and serve man? Yes, it is. Praise God and serve man. They also serve God, but so a, yeah. per, a person when they act as heralds, how how do angels serve man? Well, that that is the way that they so they serve at the behest of God, and God enlists them to serve man. Right, so that's one of the like, uh, once again, this is sort of speculative, but it's sort of fun. That's one of the theories as to why the devil was dissatisfied with man. Is that they were given a place above angels, even though they didn't seem worthy of it. Right? Uh, and so, because he's known as, uh, the devil is known as, like, before he falls and becomes, a, you know, the devil, Satan. He's one of the uh, uh, angels of God, right? Um, the morning star, Lucifer, right, is his name. Um, so that's one theory there. But yeah, so they're, uh, I mean, when they're set specifically, so we're not really given a clear picture on whether angels even have like a, like a will in the same sense that we do. Right? That they're, all of our interactions with them are then like specifically fulfilling a task God has given them. And usually like speaking his words. Doesn't the translation that we get the word angel 
angel mean messenger? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, the Greek word angelos is the same word used for messenger. Yeah. So is that like the prophet? The angels They have a similar function um, in, in the messenger side of things, but they're they're not the same as the prophets. So like I understand the um, message is from yeah, what they're speaking. Yeah, so we, the only examples we have of angels speaking is when they're speaking directly from God, which is what prophets do as well. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh huh. If they don't have a will of their own, how did Lucifer choose? Yeah, so I, I mean, that's where there's some like that's why I said it's like speculative. We don't really know. Right. Um, Another discussion for another day. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> we could, we could, but I, I mean, I don't know how much more clarity we would get. Most of the stuff that's written about that is all in the land of speculation. It doesn't, the scriptures doesn't speak to it too clearly, right? Um, I mean, you can get into that about the beginning setting of the book of Job, right? The, the devil essentially comes into the, to the kingdom of heaven and says, I bet you, Lord, that if you do this, he's going to curse you. And then Jesus, or God says, you're on, right? That's a weird setting. Like, how do we explain that? Um, so there, there's a lot of a lot of stuff concerning angels that we really don't know much about, and there's a lot of stuff written about angels that really has no authoritative backing to it, at least in our in our view from scripture. Um, most of the stuff we know about angels from scripture is weird stuff, like the number of wings they have and that they're covered in eyeballs and all kinds of things like that. Where then it becomes clear why they're saying "Do not fear" when they show up. They're not, they're not like the white robe, you know, nice looking angels that we always depict. All right, uh, let her be there. We acknowledge this in the liturgy. So TLH, page 25 and 26. As we join them in the hymn they originally sung at the fall of Isaiah. Therefore, the angels and archangels with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify that glorious name and more praise than we and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth, power and might. Oh, Oh, this is a fun uh, linguistic thing that is, is fun to remember. So if you see the word sabeo, do you know what that means? Well, uh, that's sort of a that's sort of like an anglicized version of it, but it literally in Hebrew means the Lord God of armies. Which I think is a nice like image as a reminder of like, you know, he's not just some some dude holding sheep, right? The Lord God of Sabaoth is the Lord God of armies. Um, so that's where the power and might comes from. Right? And heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Right? So that's called the Sanctus in, in, the, in the worship service. And we're intentionally drawn there as a meeting of heaven and earth. Right? That's part of what's going on in the divine service. And there what we're saying is when we sing that praise to God, we're joining the saints who have departed and are in heaven before us and the angels. Um, in that praise of God, which is, I think, pretty cool. All right, we are out of time, so we'll finish that last bit next week, and I'll look up some of that information you guys asked about from Genesis, uh, the beginning of Genesis, just to kind of clear up some of the questions as, as much as they're able to. All right, let's close with a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for creating us. We give you thanks for being our Father, that you have identified us as your beloved children, and that you restored that relationship to us in Jesus. We give you thanks for the glory of creation, and that you didn't just build it and then leave, but that you continually sustain it, that you continually guide us back to you, despite our unworthiness. We ask your blessing as we go out this week. Continue to be our good shepherd, continue to be our heavenly father, and continue to guide us back to you. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good weekend, Rich.